All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome in. So in this one, I wanted to really focus in on some of the mid to late round quarterbacks that the Jets could potentially target. Now, that's not a foregone conclusion. We don't know for sure that the Jets are going to be targeting a quarterback in this draft. Uh, but at the same time, reading the tea leaves, we don't, you know, excluding Zach Wilson, we don't have a young developmental quarterback on the roster. Aaron Rodgers is obviously up there in age. Same thing with Tyrod Taylor. You know, ideally, you do want to get a young guy in the building. Uh, we were talking potentially about trading for Sam Howell, but now he's off the board. So we look ahead to the NFL draft. Now, I don't really want to focus too, too much on, you know, the guys that are projected to go in round one. So no Caleb, no Jaden Daniels, no Drake May, no Bo Nix, no Michael Penix. I wanted to focus on five other guys, again, those mid to late round types of quarterbacks. Um, and you know, another thing too, that I feel like is relevant to bring up, if you watch how the Jets have operated through really the pre-draft process as a whole, they have really done a lot of homework on these quarterbacks. They are meeting with these guys, meeting with these guys, whether they're projected to go number one overall in the case of Caleb Williams, all the way down to guys that are projected to go in the sixth and seventh round. So they're flying contingents out to get, you know, specific scouting, uh, you know, on hand scouting at pro days. You know, to watch these quarterbacks perform, multiple, multiple me uh, meetings are in place. So, you know, I, I do feel like there is something there. Of course, it could be due diligence, but I digress. Let's take a look at this list. By no means is this, you know, a specific ranking video. We're just going to be breaking down the pros and the cons of some of these guys. So the first QB up here is Spencer Rattler, quarterback from South Carolina. For me, one of Spencer Rattler's biggest pros is he's battle tested, right? He's he's dealt with a lot, whether it's, you know, coming in to Oklahoma as, you know, a top quarterback prospect, it not really working out. He had the documentary about him where it showed a little bit, uh, you know, it, it kind of peeled back the curtain a little bit, the behind the scenes look. And, you know, from that point, a lot of people question his leadership skills, his, you know, skills as a teammate. You know, not not he, his reputation, I guess, at such a young age was in question. There was a lot of people talking about him on social media at the time. And, you know, I know that gets to pro athletes, let alone, you know, guys that are coming in as like a freshman, sophomore, you know, in college. Um, you know, with, with social media, it, it's crazy these days. So Spencer Rattler has had to deal with a lot. Then, of course, the whole Caleb Williams situation, right? Caleb steps into Oklahoma. They bench Rattler, he has to transfer out. So I, I think at this point, right, years later, Spencer Rattler, I, I think, is is pretty thick skin at, at this point. I, I don't think he's going to be um, you know, rattled by by pro situations, rattled by draft position, like, oh my god, I should have been a second round pick. You know, I'm falling to round three. I don't I don't really feel like um that's going to be there when it comes to Spencer. So we, you know, we go down the list here, great arm talent, great mechanics. He played it within a pro style offense back at South Carolina under Shane Beamer. And I do feel like that's relevant, right? Having to relay plays to the huddle, getting under center, like that stuff really, really matters. Maybe not so much, you know, in 2024 as it did 10 years ago, but it's still, you know, it, it's still a valuable trait, a, a valuable positive in my opinion here. He does have accuracy and he also had a great senior bowl. Now, some of his cons, he does play hero ball. He never really lets the play die that much. Uh, you see him from time to time just whip uh, the football off his back leg, right? He's falling backwards, he's falling backwards, and he just heaves it deep, right? <laughs> As he's being rushed back, uh, instead of just, you know, quickly throwing it away or quickly just getting down, let me just throw it in the dirt and just move on. No, there's that tendency to hold on to the football and that was on full display at Oklahoma. He got better with it, you know, under Shane Beamer at South Carolina. But at Oklahoma, it was just a mess. Like, you'd run around and take these brutal sacks. Like, that was definitely an issue. Uh, and then also, again, the leadership has been questioned in the past. Um, you know, it would be one thing if there was, like, a new documentary out on his leadership skills at South Carolina. But we just haven't really seen that, right? You know, of course, this is, like, a quarterback-loaded draft. So not many people are talking about Spencer Rattler. They're, they're not really, you, you, in other words, you're not going on, you know, you're, you're not flipping on the TV. You're not, you know, listening to sports radio, getting a bunch of Spencer Rattler content, a, a bunch of Spencer Rattler interviews. So I still feel like, you know, that documentary early on in his career is still fresh in everybody's heads. Yeah, I don't want that guy. Don't, don't want to deal with it. But the reality is 
it is years in the future here. We haven't really gotten a dose from mainstream media of how Spencer Rattler acts now. And I think people will be pretty surprised um, after, you know, spending some time going through these interviews and checking it out, um, you know, in their own time. I think Rattler right now should be anywhere from, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a second round pick, but anywhere from rounds two to three, I think is where Spencer's going to fall. But man, the thing that gets me so fired up, effortless, effortless arm strength. It doesn't even look like he tries, right? Like as a, as a college prospect, the way he throws the football is beautiful. Okay, so the next quarterback up here is Michael Pratt from Tulane. And funny enough, the Jets actually uh, flew out to specifically scout Michael Pratt at his, uh, you know, at the Green Wave Pro Dam. And Pratt is a guy who has a ton of experience. He has so many starts under his belt. Like he is the leader. Like, I mean, you look at Tulane football. Yes, of course, they have a good defense. But man, Tulane over these past really since Pratt has been there, they have been freaking dominant. They have been freaking all over the place, right? They're pumping out NFL players. They have speed. They have smarts. They have toughness. Now, granted, Willie Fritz just uh, left for Houston, so that's go it's going to be interesting to kind of monitor the, the two-lane situation they promoted from within. Um, but nonetheless, Michael Pratt is somebody who could have, if he wanted to, he could have transferred to one of these big-time you know schools, potentially an SEC school or a Big Ten school. He had that ability. There were tons of rumors that he could have hit the portal, but he didn't he wanted to stay at Tulane and he had another great season right of course by the stats and the wins but also winning the AAC player of the year so Michael Pratt again he's experienced he has a lot of starts under his belt he gets the football out of his hands which I really really like um, he can pick apart a defense it has a high football IQ you know you get that watching Michael Pratt he he knows where to go with the football there are times like especially in two minute drills it's just effortless just boom 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 completion completion uh, completion right down the field touchdown knows exactly where to go with the football and I feel like he's going to be a quick learner and I think a part of that is because of the experience but uh with that comes his accuracy and decision making so you know you're never really seeing Michael Pratt just like whip the ball in a double coverage or like coming up you know come off the field shrugging his shoulders saying you know I don't know what I'm seeing or wh whatever the case is he he doesn't really have many series or games where he's just where he's holding the team back he always kind of seems like he's under control knows where to go nothing really freaks him out on the defensive side of the football but of course you know with a quarterback that's being mocked to go in the mid to late rounds here he does have a couple of cons number one is the arm strength and that's really really apparent He's not putting a ton of velocity on the football. There's a lot of people who question the velocity. It's just not really there. So Pratt works well in the short game, in the intermediate game, uh, off of play action. I, I feel like he does really, really good job. And he, it's not to say that he can't throw a deep ball because he does have good accuracy and touch down the field. But I don't know if he can consistently push the ball down the field, right? Um, you know, where he's just throwing frozen ropes down the field for 50 yards, just bang on down the field, touchdown, explosive plays. I don't really feel like you're going to be getting that again at the NFL level when it comes to Michael Pratt. I actually see a lot of uh, Cooper Rush when I watch Michael Pratt. So I think he's super interesting. I do feel like he would fit the Jets system and I would be really uh, encouraged if the Jets scoop him up in those, again, mid to late rounds here. Okay, so next up, is Keaton Slovis, quarterback from BYU. Somebody who I feel like is really intriguing, somebody who I feel like makes a ton of sense for a team like the Rams or the Dolphins or, you know, the 49ers. Uh, I, I know they have Brock Purdy, you know, super young quarterback, but man, Keaton Slovis has some likable traits, but I think he would be maybe best fit for like a traditional West Coast offense where he can really work off a of play action. You know, you look at Slovis's college career, it, it, it's crazy, right? Three different schools, BYU, Pittsburgh before BYU, and then before that USC, where he looked to be like a top three pick, but then, you know, of course, experienced injuries and then got, you know, um, you know, kind of had the Rattler experience where he had to transfer out because he got beat out. But if we look at Slovis's pros, in my opinion, again, he has a lot of starts experience under his belt, but he's a natural thrower of the football. It just looks so easy and effortless. It looks like he was born to do this. He also knows how to layer the football as well. You know, somebody who can, you know, arc the ball over linebackers, but not put too much on it to where safeties are going to be, you know, screaming down on it. 
and be able to, you know, snag interceptions. You see throws where he can fit the football like right over the corner's shoulder, uh, right over the corner's head, excuse me, drops it into the bucket before the safety can get there on the perimeter. Um, you know, I, I think when you take a look at those types of throws, those are really, really in, th like that. That stuff stands out when you're talking about going to the next level. It's not just fastball, 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 like with Zach Wilson, right? We've seen a lot of that with Zach Wilson, where he just puts so much heat on the football. Like you got to know how to take stuff off, right? No one to turn it up, no one to take stuff off. And I think Slovis does a really good job of that. Understanding, like, again, the layering of the defense, knowing how much, I guess, like, gas to put on the ball. Um, and again, you know, he, he did that time and time again at BYU. He's also an underrated athlete. You know, he ran a 4.55.40, I believe, at the combine. You know, he can move. He kind of has that Joe Burrow type of mobility where, you know, you think of Joe Burrow, you think of passes down the field. You think of, you know, deep shots to Jamar Chase. But then a small percentage of those Joe Burrow highlights in my head is him keeping it on a read option and tucking it and running for 20 yards. Or him being on a third and goal, you know, lining up in shotgun, snapping the ball, pulling it back and then taking it in, you know, for a quick, quick, like little three yard game. Boom, he's in for a TD. Slovis has that same kind of underrated athlete, um, you know, ability to him. So he's kind of the opposite of like a Nick Foles or something like that, where he's just a statue back there, right? Slovis is a pocket passer, but he can throw on the run and he can make plays outside of the pocket. And then last but not least, his pocket presence is actually really good, right? His ability to step up into the pocket, uh, maneuver, feel pressure. And that's, you know, something that if you are expected to work off of play action, you can't be, you know, Again, expected to work off a of play action, but scared to step up in the pocket, and you're f and you're floating backwards, you're falling backwards all the time. You, you just can't have that, right? You need to have somebody who can feel pressure, feel when people are breathing down your neck, somebody who knows when to get rid of the football. And is you know, is Slovis the perfect quarterback here? No, right? Like he he definitely has a lot of cons. Um, one of which is he's been hurt a lot. He's had a lot of injuries throughout the college, you know, throughout his collegiate career, uh, as well as having to transfer a lot, right? If Slovis was that dude, he probably would have stayed at USC. He would have stayed at Pitt, not bounced around to three different schools. And it's not like he possesses like the craziest, craziest of arms either. Um, you know, I, I think it's good enough. I, I think it's for sure good enough. But I don't, you know, you're watching him in, I, I don't think, like if you're watching Slovis play, you're not saying like, man, that guy's a great arm. Like th this guy's like, you know, top half of the league in arm strength. It's just not really like that. I, I think it's good enough to execute an offense, but it's not, you know, to the point of where you're blown away or anything like that. I mean, I think Spencer Rattler has a better arm. There's a player on this list who I think has a better arm than Slovis as well. Uh, really two players. Um here on the rest of this list that I think maybe have better arms, but I just feel like, you know, if you start comparing them to, you know, the stronger arms in the NFL, Rodgers, Mahomes, Josh Allen, uh, whoever it may be, I think Slovis is kind of, he falls in the tier of like a Daniel Jones right around that Derek Carr where, yeah, it's good enough, but it, it, it's not wowing people. So for me, I really like Slovis as a prospect. I think he's super interesting, again, because of the mechanics, because of just him being so natural with it. And I think if he does land with a team like the Miami Dolphins or the LA Rams, he would kind of be a late round find for one of those coaches. So yeah, I like Slovis. Okay, so next up is Florida State quarterback Jordan Travis. Now, Travis is super interesting because you looked at last season and he was having a great year, right? TD to INT ratio, freaking undefeated. The Seminoles were having like an all-time year. It looked destined for them to make the college football playoff. And I still feel like they should have made it in, by the way. But that's, you know, neither here, neither here nor there. But I'm still, I'm still angry about it for sure. Anyway, Travis gets hurt. I believe it was against uh, Southern Miss. I watched that game and it was just a... Like, if you're a Knowles fan, like, and you watch that game, you it just felt like your heart got ripped out, right? But Jordan Travis, you know, projecting him to the next... And by the way, the reason why it hurt so bad was because that was Travis's last season as a college quarterback, right? He's been there for a long time. No more years left. That was it. So for him to go out on a play where he broke his leg at the end of the season sucks. 
it absolutely sucks. But you project him to the next level. What are you getting? Jordan Travis is a gamer. He's a freaking game. Like he will put his, he'll lower his shoulder. He'll try to truck a guy over. It seems like in those big, big moments, he really d tries to put the team on his back. He's not afraid to let the ball loose down the field, but not so much in a reckless way. And granted, he did have two good wide, uh, you know, receiver threats in Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman, and also Benson at running back. And like Florida State's freaking, like they they are they are stacked. Uh, and of course, Norvell Collin plays, um, who's an offensive genius. So Travis is just somebody that you want in your foxhole on game day, right? Again, he's a gamer. He will do whatever it takes to win. He's a good decision maker, right? Again, we can reference the TD to INT ratio. Uh, knows when to uncork one. Right, he's not just doing it constantly. All right, hopefully somebody's down there. No, it, it seems like there is a methodical approach. There is, you know, a method to his deep shots. When to take them, when not to take them. So I think overall, as a pro, and and again, you can push back and say, well, he did have two really good receivers. You know, college defensive coordinators can't really square up with the amount of talent that Florida State had offensively. Of course, guys are going to get open, which is totally fair, but. You know, if you watch Travis play, he's not making errors, you know, drive after drive after drive. Florida State's offense isn't just stalling out because the quarterback play sucks. He, he makes good decisions. He is mobile right now. That is a bit in question because, again, he is coming off the broken leg that happened late in the year. But he does provide a lot of mobility. He is athletic. He can make plays outside of the pocket. And also, when the play breaks down, I feel like that's where Travis is. Uh, not necessarily at his best, but uh, at his best, but he can be dangerous there. He also got better every year, right? If we think back to Travis first coming into Florida State, he wasn't a highly touted prospect. I believe he was actually a three star. Uh, could be wrong in that exact rating, but you know he came in and had to battle, and battle, and battle. He won the job. It didn't look good. People were saying, "Oh, you know, we got to move on. He's not good enough." Early on, right? I'm talking about certain seminal, like a portion of the Seminoles fan base. Like, is he that dude, right? There was a lot of question marks there, but they stuck with him. Norvell stuck with him. Now he's my guy. He's my guy. And again, every year got a little bit better, a little bit better. And then boom, all of a sudden exploded. And he, he was a steady hand for the Seminoles offense late into his career. And, uh, you know, is by the numbers, one of the better Florida state Seminole quarterbacks of all time. So, um, you know, because of that, I, I think there is something to be said for development. You know, um, we're so used to seeing guys come in, hit the league and be great early, right? CJ Stroud, Justin Herbert, uh, all these, like there's a bunch of young, Lamar Jackson. There's so many young quarterbacks, first round pick, boom, they play, they're great, right? I mean, Brock Purdy played in the Super Bowl last year. The development aspect can be overlooked. Look at Jared Goff as a perfect example. Year one to year two, Josh Allen, year one to year two to year three. So I am I am impressed with Travis's uh, resilience and perseverance, you know, growing at the position. And he also has good enough arm strength. You know, I, I think for a shorter quarterback like him, a smaller quarterback like him, your mind just kind of instantly jumps to weaker arm if you don't watch him or you don't watch Florida State consistently. But his arm strength is actually good enough. Um, it, it jumps out of his hands really quickly. And I do feel like it is good enough for sure at the NFL level. Uh, now, of course, the cons, size, consistent footwork a bit of an issue and again coming off the broken leg how ready will he be uh for the, you know rookie minicamp and whatnot is he somebody that's going to be missing time and also kind of the rehab pro like um the the mental game right i mean the rehab process is one thing but you know getting trying to learn a, a playbook trying to you know form chemistry and connections with an nfl not only just you know coaching staff but the personnel around around him but also having to deal with, oh man, can my leg hold up on this? Am I dropping back at full speed? Am I thinking about it during the play? Trying to maybe shield himself in practice. It, will that hold him back? Right, that is a big question mark. And I feel like that could be a reason why he ends up falling to, you know, potentially around six or seven. So I think for, uh, for Travis, there's a lot of likable traits, but it just sucks that injury happened so late in the if the if if the injury happened in week one or two that would be one thing but because it happened so late uh it, it's just tough for me because you know it's not like he's out there throwing at the combine participating in the senior bowl and whatnot he's just not having any of these reps 
And last but definitely not least, quarterback from Tennessee, formerly of Michigan, Joe Milton. Now, Milton is somebody that you watch and you're like, oh my God, this guy has one of the best arms I've ever seen. Elite arm power. Whether you want to talk about velocity, whether you want to talk about throwing the ball down the field, Joe Milton checks both of those boxes. It's so much fun to watch him throw, right? Puts good spin on the ball. The second Milton gets drafted, he will have one of the best arms in football, no matter if he's a good quarterback or you know a horrible quarterback. The arm strength is unquestioned. He also has great size. He's 6'5", 235, and mobile, right? He can run. He can hurt defenses on the ground. If you're an offensive coach, you're looking at Joe Milton saying, okay, this guy has like one of the best arms I've ever seen. He has great size where he can, you know, take hits. He's not getting, you know, like uh, thrown around back there in the pocket. He can stand in and make throws. Uh, he's not afraid to tuck it and run. He has the speed and athleticism to hurt defenses on the ground. There's a lot to like there. Then you take a look at just like the, the basic stats, TD to INT ratio, 20 to 5. He did take care of the football. Now, you can say, well, hold on. You know, you look at Heupel's offense with Tennessee. There was a lot of screens. There was a lot of deep shots. Um, Explosive. It, it, it's kind of one of those offenses where it seemed like there was a lot of predetermined stuff happening uh like milton like the receiver like the coach everybody knew where the football was going pre-snap so when it comes to the nfl right and there's you know the post-snap recognition and whatnot that is going to be a huge huge question mark right can milton adjust so i think because of that this preseason is going to be absolutely monumental for him if he is out there completing a bunch of passes if he can progress through his reads get the ball to his check down again this preseason not talking about three years from now this year like in a couple months if he can do that i think milton like there, there could be there could be something there like to get excited about because in my opinion that's going to be his biggest question mark um you know, at the NFL level, right? When you're throwing complex uh, defensive looks at him or you have late shifts post-snap, can Milton adjust? And at this point in time, we don't know. So if he's showing glimpses that he can do it in year one of preseason, what will happen in year three? He should be good to go, uh, you know, maybe even by year two, but definitely by year three, I, I think if that's the case. Uh, but yeah, going back to, uh, I guess his cons here. He is raw, and this all kind of this, this all all of the cons go hand in hand here. He's raw. Not many starts as well. I, I think he only has 17 total starts as a, as a college quarterback. Of course, Hendon Hooker was the Volunteers QB a year ago, but initially Milton beat him out, and the offense wasn't really working. They put in Hendon, who was a transfer from uh, Virginia Tech, and then the offense exploded. Milton had time to sit on the bench after coming in from Michigan and, uh, you know, obviously took the reins this year, they weren't as explosive and crazy in the winning category as they were a year ago back in 2022, but it was still a productive offense nonetheless. So anyway, let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Do you want the Jets to draft, target one of these young quarterbacks? And if so, who? I would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks so much for watching. And as always, go Jets.